Southeast Asia, just above the equator, lies the island of Borneo. The northern part of the island is called Sabah. Once a British colony, Sabah is now a state of the independent nation of Malaysia. In 1967 and 68, Carol Davidson, an American sculptor, lived in Sabah with her husband and children as a Peace Corps family. In this land below the wind, Carol found that nature was harsh, but the people gentle. I came to love the people of Saba, who accepted the naturalness of all that life offered. Village life was like an extended family. Gentle caring for each other was their custom and included the stranger. When I left Saba in 1968, Justin Stimol, a dear friend and one of Saba's most popular folk singers, asked me to find a way to tell the story of his people. For 14 years, our letters crossed half a world. Finally, I knew how I could tell his story and play back my own. Would there still be an old Borneo? We worked together to make this tape. Justin and his sister Evelyn, Justin's daughter Cyrilla, grandmother Nuri, and sister Sarindai all welcomed us into their homes. Babette, a French camera woman, Louis, a Chinese-American video engineer, and I, a visual artist, set off to learn how the lives of Saba's people were changing. Malaysia, independent since 1963, includes Saba and Sarawak on the island of Borneo and the Malay Peninsula to the west. West Malaysia is more developed economically. Most of the people are ethnic Malays and Chinese. Islam is the dominant religion. Sabah is in less developed East Malaysia and has a culturally and religiously more diverse population. 75% of Sabah's one million people are Bumiputra, sons of the soil. Each group has its own language and customs. The Katazans are the largest indigenous group. Traditionally, they were rice farmers who believed in a world of good and evil spirits. But in the last century, many became Christian. The Maruts were formerly nomads and headhunters. Now, most are farmers. They too are Christian, though today, many are converting to Islam. The Bajaus are horsemen, fishermen, and traders. They are mostly Muslim. The Chinese arrived in Saba in the 12th century and are now almost one quarter of the population. They are Buddhist, Christian, or secular. The Chinese do every kind of work in Saba and they have prospered. Hindu Indians came to tap the rubber trees. Now they do everything also. The most recent arrivals are political refugees from the Philippines, who are Muslim. In 1963, Islam became the official state religion of Malaysia. Today, all of Sabah's people face pressure to abandon their distinctive heritages, convert to Islam, and become one people. Justin Stemel is a Katazan whose life's goal is to record and preserve his people's traditions. The songs Justin writes and sings celebrate Katazan life. Karazan <laughs> 
karazano po nga tuhun tauripon No ay sonoro pisong buwan Karazan may kitunod do guluon No ay zominakas do suluban I never thought I would see you again. When you left Saba, I said to you, you are an artist. You must find a way to tell the story of my people. I thought a long time about film to tell your story, but decided to use videotape because with instant playback, we could both show and share the story while we were making it. It is really fascinating. Video can capture a distant world, a distant country, a culture of a people. To be shown in a little box like a TV screen. It can be transported and it can be played at any time. One can see the other at any time. Now we are on the way to the interior village of Tambunan. Ancient Saba still exists there, where time is as slow as it once was. The Tambunan district is a Karazan community of about 5,000 people, 100 miles inland. Carrying a gift of fresh seafood, the video crew has come to spend three days in Tambunan. Justin's new wife, Lo Lin, grew up here. Her family has invited the crew to stay in their home. When you come into the house of a Karazan family and they happen to be eating, you will be invited to join them. The hospitality is just as I recall from Peace Corps days. Once again, I have that very special feeling of being totally accepted and part of Saba's world. Even Louis and Babette have become part of the family, but only one gets to eat at a time. The other must run the camera. <laughs> Hospitality is just a natural way for any Karazan to show kindness to their own kind or even to strangers. <laughs> this village woman has been living with Lolin's family for 10 years. It's Saba's way of extending the family so that no one is alone. If one is hospitable, the beneficial spirits will bring good luck, good harvest, and healthy crops. In this farming community, the favors of the spirits are needed to provide good weather for growing rice. In May, the regular late afternoon rains mark the arrival of plowing time.
In Saba, the ancient practice of Gotong Royong, working together, binds old and young in hard work and pleasure. We Kadazans do not see ourselves apart from the community. Each has his work and feels that he belongs to a secure village life. Men and boys always plough, while the women build dikes. Our irrigation is simple gravity flow. In October, when the party is fruiting, the young children sit in the tiny house, pulling strings of rattles to keep the birds away. Planting rice is always accompanied by ritual. Conforming to an age-old custom of fertility, only women can tuck the seedlings into the soil. Now the shoots will grow and ripen, and the cycle will be repeated. <laughs> After plowing and planting, it is Karazan custom to slaughter a pig to feed the community. Justin's daughter Cirillo witnesses her first slaughter as the farmers prepare for their party. The party is the pleasure side of Gotong Royong, and making the tapai, rice wine, is the task of the farmer's wife. It is also custom to slaughter a pig to settle an argument. The Karazans believe feasting soothes the temper. The Karazans never want to be seen arguing openly or showing anger in public because they will lose face. Why is it so important not to lose face? Because everyone wants a good image. We notice Babet, Louis and you quarrel in public and be friends the next moment. My friends were shocked. I said, that's the Western style. We should adopt it. We do remain friends, but it takes its toll. I like Sable Bay better. I don't have to protect myself from people's anger, and I can relax. I'm impressed again by the honesty of life in Saba. People accept nature and each other. When I ask why, I am told it is Dao Dao. Dao Dao means natural. The natural world is Dao Dao. The natural being is Dao Dao. The natural tree is Dao Dao. Okay, better stop. Run. I brought balloons from America for the children. I didn't know that nature had already provided, but only one per pig, one per family. It is a Tambunan Tapai party, just as I remember. Tonight, 
After eating and drinking, the farmers have gathered to watch themselves on video playback. Here in the interior, life has always been recorded by human memory. Tonight, we share the way the modern world stores information electronically. It is interesting that in the West, television isolates us. Here in a farmhouse without electricity, it is a vehicle for friendship. Everyone must take their turn at the tap by jar. Fresh tap by is potent and bitter. If you spoon the soup along with the tap by, you only get drunk, not sick. Evelyn takes her turn. No one may refuse. It's part of the hospitality. <laughs> In the 19th century, Catholic missionaries who educated the Katazans tried to stop the Tapai drinking. The Katazans and their ability to assimilate new religion and old customs combined Tapai drinking with hymn singing. I was here when Cirilla was born. She is a very special child to me. Now Cirilla is showing me Saba ways I never learned before. Traditionally, women bathe outside wearing a sarong. Slipping out of the sarong, but not out of the towel, is the hard part. All Saba girls have mastered this art by age 10. With tutoring from Cirilla, I did it without a slip. He might not want to leave. He might like you so much. <laughs> Justin had been keeping this slow Loris as a pet. But at my urging, he released him to find a home in the jungle around Tambun. <laughs> Time to the people of Saba is different than to Westerners. We have no written history. Without clocks, we count days by tying knots on a string. Each day we cut a knot to keep track of time. Should I cut the knot? Yeah. Or last, last day? It's very sad, you know. <laughs> when you see one more going.
The Kardasans believe your lifeline is determined by the number of knots tied on your string at birth. Each year the god, Kenoingan, unties one knot. Sometimes he falls asleep, forgetting to untie the knots, giving someone a long life. Our 80-year-old auntie has just died. Her traditional Karazan clothes hang ready for burial. When a person dies, Kinoingan checks the string. If any knots remain tied, he sends the soul back home. By wailing and sweeping, the relatives try to prevent its return. And the poor soul then becomes a haunting ghost, forever bothering people. Karazans believe in life after death. The spirit rides the spirit of the buffalo to Mount Kinabalu, the highest mountain in Southeast Asia. Before climbing Mount Kinabalu, the soul has to take a bath in a little pool. When the soul feels it is clean, it is ready to enter the faraway land. Only life in heaven is perfect. The houses are good and comfortable. Food is plenty and everyone is young and beautiful. Friends and family unite once more. There is no strife between people, no quarreling, no saving face, no losing face. The buffalo is the most important animal to the people of Saba. He is transport, he pulls the plow, he gives you meat. He carries your spirit to the faraway land. He buys you a wife. A man who has many buffalo is a rich man and can sacrifice a buffalo for a feast. I will miss the slow rhythms of old Saba, but I know roads and electricity are welcome changes. We are on our way to Evelyn's house in Phnom Penh, Saba's largest Katazan community, where I first met Justin's family. Now in Evelyn's house, time has caught up, and we are being treated to every modern convenience. Now it's so different because it's more advanced, more westernized. Every time, like now I'm working, I've been working. I have to reach my office about 8 o'clock and uh, I have a lot of things to do. So I have to finish this thing within time. So that really sort of pressure me. So sometimes I have this headache and then uh, it gives me ulcer. And maybe the ulcer is also pressure from drinking. I'm a social drinker myself. 
and if I take too much, you know, our customs, it's so difficult to avoid the drinks. So when you have too much, you know, it really aggravates my ulcer. Then I have to go to the doctor and see him about the medicine. So he gave me x-rays and things like that. So it is time has changed so much. My friends' lives have changed from when I lived here. Justin, I wonder what difference Peace Corps made. Peace Corps has given us the feeling of valuing ourselves and reason to believe that we are socially equal to other societies. In Peace Corps days, Penampang was an isolated community like Tambunan. Now it's been transformed. On land that once was rice paddy field, they are building their condominiums. I remember in 1967, there was only paddy field and jungle. We came to your wedding and I took my first home movies. I remember, you learned to drink tapai and heen and do the sumazau, our traditional dance. Penampang was the first place I had ever felt so much at ease. Even though I was white and taller and different, you never judged me. I didn't have to be anything but what I was. You were an artist and a stranger in my country. I wanted to show you what we had here, what we are. I followed along, watching and listening, absorbing a whole new way of life. One day you came to see me at my home. Yes, I came to tell you that my wife had given birth to a baby girl, and we called her Surila. And I came to Penampang and held her and she became my special child. What happened to your first marriage? We went on for seven years. We made three children, but love ended somewhere along the line. We accepted our fate. In the West, we think of divorce as something very modern, but living in Sabah, I learned it was common in Katazan life my childhood days um, about early 1970s my mother after she was divorced from my father when we built that house in this new kampung there were only my mother and myself and my two younger sisters so our neighbors helped us Justin was not with me that time he was already a working man we used to get up in the morning to tap the rubber and then about three o'clock in the morning. So by six o'clock we are back, and we make breakfast, and then we go to school. Um, I take my breakfast from home. I, I take it with me to school, but I put it down near the, this, this sago palm. I just put it inside the leaf, you know? It sticks out like that, so I just put it in. And then it's not only me, there are other kids who do that. So during, uh, after our school is over, we come back, and then we go to this place and then we have a you know little gathering together and eat the rice so after that we go home and then normally when we reach home it's uh, back to work again it just really hard life and my mother used to catch fish in the paddy fields with the nets so that's what we eat and now we're staying in your house and you have uh, yeah. six rooms yeah i i never i never even dreamed that my life would ever become better you know and sometimes when I used to talk about it now, I get very emotional. Well, you certainly have made a wonderful life here. Yeah, and I thank God for that. I really appreciate what I have. 